Hello everyone, this is Professor Suzuki. In this lecture, we are covering research methods in psychology. Now, before we begin, I'm just going to tell you a little story, a bit of a brain teaser, I guess, um, before we begin to kind of illustrate why research methods are so important and what they really are. But I think it's safe to say that everyone in this class, everyone who's watching this video right now, agrees that the world is round. I don't think we have too many people who think the world is flat. And the reason we agree the world is round, because even though we studied it as kids and we know math and physics, we don't, well, out of all of us, maybe there's one or two in here who feels like they're an expert in math or physics. But for the rest of us, we know because of what we were taught in schools and the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, NASA, they tell us that the world is round. But tomorrow, if NASA came out and NASA just looked at, you know, put out a press release and said, uh, fuck it. Yeah, we were wrong. Earth's flat. Here's the math. Some people may just agree. You know, Pluto's not a planet anymore. NASA said so. We agree. World's flat. All right. NASA said so. We agree. Others, you may be thinking, wait, wait, how did you get there? What did you do? You're going to want to assess their research methods. You're going to want to know how they did what they did. So research is important because it separates science from pseudoscience with the ways we collect data to go about and explain or understand the facts of the world. So before we begin, there is a video right below this. Uh, it's to a colleague of mine, Dr. Ian Duncan. Most of you guys know him as John Oliver. He's going to explain a bit about research methods and then please resume to this video. All right, so now that you've seen the video, we're gonna pick up from last lecture a bit in the scope of research. So we talked a bit about PhD and PsyD. Those are a doctor of philosophy and doctor of psychology, respectively. Those who go off and try to achieve a PhD typically are doing research-oriented work. They will work for the APA or the National Science Foundation, uh, maybe do work at a university researching and lecturing. Whereas the other set who go on to receive their doctorate in PsyD will do more application and clinical practice. Now, of course, there are those who have a psychiatric MD. This means they achieved both a PsyD and an MD, so they can practice psychology, psychiatry, and prescribe medication. So when looking at those with the PhD, the ones who are doing the research, you have to keep in mind that their research is done in an empirical manner. That is, it's grounded in objective, tangible evidence that can be seen time and time again, regardless of who is observing. That means, Unlike astrology, where you need someone who can interpret things and will just tell you kind of a vague idea, research, you aren't making these big claims. You're just there looking for something, you observe it and you see it no matter what the situation is. Or if you're making a manipulation, you can attribute things to that manipulation because it's the only thing that happened. So really, what I'm saying is research must be valid. That means the material has to uh, really measure what it sets out to measure, and research has to be reliable. That means we can, well, replicate it, do it again, and make sure we're getting consistent results. So it's important to keep in mind that research is powered by facts. Facts are observable realities. They're not your opinions. I mean, some facts can be opinions, but opinions aren't facts, despite what uh, Joan Calamezzo below says. So keep in mind, Facts can only be established using evidence collected through empirical research, through objective, tangible research. You'd be surprised how many times I have to tell people that their opinions aren't facts. So what is an opinion? Well, those are simply personal judgments, conclusions, or attitudes that may or may not be accurate. And we're, when we're looking to compare science to pseudoscience, this little comic really sums it up. Something that is done in a scientific manner has the facts, these observed realities, and they're trying to draw about conclusions. They're trying to figure out why this is going on. A pseudoscience, on the other hand, already has the conclusion. It has what's going on, and it looks for pre-existing facts to support it. Now, if you can hear the difference in that, you're fine. If not, maybe meet me in office hours. <laughs> 
So when we're using the scientific method, we're going to define a few key terms that you're going to see here. And if you take research methods further on, will be a common theme. And first off, something you've probably heard, you've probably heard your friends say, hey, I have a theory. Well, unfortunately, not a lot of people use this term correctly. So let's just get into it. A theory is not a single idea, but it's actually a set of ideas, a well-developed collective systematic body of ideas that propose an explanation for an observed phenomenon. So it's not just one idea. There has to be a lot of different research, different ideas put together that lay groundwork for a theory to be a theory. On the other hand, how do we get to a theory? Well, we have to test that things. We have to come up with these ideas to explore. And this is done with a hypothesis, a testable prediction about how the world will behave if our idea is correct. Now, these are often worded, worded as an if-then statement. And keep in mind, a good hypothesis has to be falsifiable. One thing that separates science from pseudoscience is that scientific hypotheses are capable of being wrong. They can be proven incorrect. That's something that's surprisingly lacking in pseudoscience. So now that we've gone over a few key terms, we're going to look at the various research approaches and study designs used in psychology. Now, one thing to keep in mind, we're going to be talking about correlation. Note that correlation is not causation. This is a key phrase. You're gonna hear it all throughout your careers as a student in psychology, in research. What this means, just because we see two relationships, let's take smoking and lung cancer, right? Let's say we see a correlational study and we see those who smoke are more likely to have lung cancer. If it says it's correlational, all we know is that there is a relationship between smoking and lung cancer. We can't say smoking causes lung cancer because the alternate, we can't prove, maybe lung cancer, those who have lung cancer are just more likely to smoke. So we can never really say correlation is causation. And that's just something you will hear over and over again. So for our first study, one of the most popular examples that you're going to hear in the field of psychology, case studies are full in-depth examinations of individuals or small groups of participants. This means there is something interesting that happened to a very select few and we wanna know more. What's the most uh, famous case study? This individual right here by the name Phineas Gage. Now, Unfortunately, no matter what school you go to, no matter what psych class you take, you're probably going to hear this name. But Phineas Gage is a pretty unique individual, so it's worth noting. He was a dude who, otherwise normal, working on a railroad, because that was the thing in his day, was walking, and kaboom, explosion. Iron rod shoots through the ground, pierces through his skull, as we can see in this image right here. And he lives. He's actually one of the first case studies in psychology because... It notices the changes in his behavior and it was able to kind of learn a bit more about how the brain works. Now, as great as a case study is, you have to keep in mind that they're very difficult to generalize. Generalization, generalizing, is the ability to apply findings from a research study to a larger population, to the greater society. I mean, because case studies are so in-depth on individuals or small groups, you really can't say oh, well, because of this case study, that's why the population acts like this. That's why all of these people, this big group, no, that, that's not a thing with case studies. If we're looking on seeing more widespread behavior in a population, then we'd maybe opt for the naturalistic observation approach. This is observing participants in a natural habitat without interacting or interfering. So for those who are aware of Jane Goodall, she's one of the most famous anthropologists ever. She uh, made her career by studying gorillas in the wild. Uh, I did a similar experiment in college studying the frat boys in the wild and uh, living in a frat house is not good. That's what I learned. Jokes aside, in naturalistic observation, the main point is as the name says, you're just observing in a natural habitat. There are a couple problems, however, with this design. One is when you are observing behavior, you may just you might think you notice something that really wasn't there because you were expecting to see it. In those cases, we call that observation bias, when the observations may be skewed to align with whatever the observer's expectations are. 
Now that's with an individual, but let's say we have a team watching people, right? And you train them. Well, if that's the case and you have multiple people watching a natural behavior and setting, you wanna make sure there's high inner rater reliability. And this is simply a fancy way to say the, there is agreement between your multiple observers on how to record and classify an event. So let's say I had three observers helping me with a study on aggression in children. And I tell them, every time you see a child act in, a, in an aggressive way, so they're shoving another kid or they hit another kid or they take something that doesn't belong to them, we rate that as a mark on the aggression score. And let's say observer A and B both put something like eight and seven, that's fairly good inner rater reliability. But what if observer C puts 27 acts of aggression? Then we see lower inner rater reliability among the three observers. So when you're a researcher and you are setting up a naturalistic observation, it's really important you clearly outline to your research team how to track behavior, how to track and classify the event. Moving on, a method that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, especially when online shopping or about to eat dinner and you get that pesky telephone call, the survey method. And just as the name implies, it's the use of surveys to field responses from a sample. Now, a few notes with the survey method, as powerful as it is to distribute surveys and to get responses, any survey over 10 minutes, really over five even, anything that's seven minutes plus, let's just go with that, you end up having people drop out. Some folks just don't want to stay on the survey that long, they get bored. So you need to make sure your survey isn't too time consuming. And another thing, if we want our survey to be generalizable to the public, then you need a lot of people's opinion. So in other words, size matters. And really think about it. For all of you who use Yelp when you go out, if you saw a Yelp restaurant with four stars and it had 23 reviews, would you go to that one? Or would you go to the Yelp reviewed restaurant with four stars that had 1,200 reviews. You're probably gonna to lean to the one with 1,200 because it's more people, it's more opinions there, you can trust it a little bit more than the Yelp reviewed restaurant with only 23 reviews. All right, now let's say you just don't wanna deal with people or you wanna look into research that's already been done and try to see themes or trends, then maybe you'd be interested in archival research. And as the name says, it's using past records or archive data to answer research questions, or you use that data to look for patterns or relationships, such as the way uh, traffic accidents go. Is there a change between the 1950s to 2020? Maybe we're interested in uh, the rates of the flu vaccinations and how well they work. So we look at past records and data to find patterns or to answer these kind of questions. Now a couple more designs that are used for developmental psychology. One, we have the longitudinal research design. And this is where data is gathered by repeatedly testing people over a large amount of time. So this means this could be a study that lasts 10, 15, even 20 years where you start with someone in their childhood and then every two years you catch up with them and you interview them to see what kind of changes in thoughts or behavior they may have. And while this is really one of the best ways to study human development, we do see an issue with something known as attrition rate. This is the reduction in the number of participants due to dropout. This is sometimes called morality, mort uh, mortality, sorry. Pretty much just as the name implies, people who drop out because of various reasons. It could be they don't wanna participate. It could be they moved away. They could have maybe died anything that causes a reduction in number. And that's something we see in the LRD, the Longitudinal Research Design. On the other hand, another method used in developmental psychology is the cross-sectional research design. And this is where we compare multiple segments of the population at the same time, so during that study. So let's say we're interested in looking at behaviors towards Doctor Who, we can have groups of 10 to 17 year olds, 18 to 25 year olds, 26 to 36 year olds, 37 plus, and we can compare those multiple groups, their views and opinions. So 
speaking of all these studies, these were all correlational studies. And this just means that a relationship exists between the two variables, but that doesn't imply cause and effect. So once again, correlation is not causation. And a fun story that really drives this point is that one of my friends, uh, his grandfather had a convenience store. And surprisingly, he would never sell ice cream in the summer, even though it's hot, because he always said when he sells more ice cream, there'd be more crime. And that's actually a true statistic. When ice cream sales go up, so do crime rates. Does that mean you know, eating ice cream leads to a crime spree because people want to celebrate? Well, no, actually it's heat. Crime goes up in the summer. People consume more ice cream in the summer. That's why you can't say when you see a correlation that there's causation. You can only say there's a relationship. So speaking a little bit more about correlations, something you should know is a correlation coefficient is the value between one to negative one. So negative one to one, sorry, indicating the strength and direction of the relationship. So the bottom left, we see a positive correlation. It's a line with the slope increasing. In the middle, we see a negative correlation. The slope is decreasing. And on the right, the far right, we see a no correlation where you really just don't see a line. Now, one thing to keep in mind is it doesn't matter if the number is positive or negative. When you look at a correlation coefficient, you're judging the absolute value. For those who forgot what an absolute value is, that simply means you ignore whatever is in front, positive or negative, and whatever that number is, the closer it is to one, the stronger the relationship is. The plus or minus just indicates whether it's sloped upwards, like on the left over here, or if it's sloped downwards, like in the middle. Now, a few problems with correlations. One thing we said before with the uh, ice cream and the crime, we sometimes see illusory correlations these false correlations that, well, people believe relationships exist between two things when it really doesn't happen. So as I said, my friend's grandpa thought it was selling ice cream that led to further crime. It was just the heat. That was an illusory correlation. And one problem we have with correlations, especially with people who do their research, is sometimes we run into confirmation bias, which is a tendency to ignore evidence that disproves ideas or belief. I'm sure some of you may deal with that when talking to loved ones who don't want to believe you, but unfortunately I have no tips for that. Now moving on, related to the illusory correlations, we also have something known as confounding variables. Now I'm going to take a quick pause, let you guys watch the video because it's a fun example of a confounded motion. So go ahead and watch that video and I'll... Uh, Resume. It should be the second one after John Oliver. All right, so you're probably wondering why I had you watch that clip. Well, in that video, let's say that was an actual experiment. We had two researchers trying to communicate and seeing how the communication affects mood. But that bubble that we saw, that Squidward, that that would be a confound. It's an unanticipated outside factor that pretty much screwed with the variables. So when we can recognize it, when we can identify it, it's a confound. So the illusory correlation that we saw between heat and, I'm sorry, the illusory correlation we saw between ice cream sales and crime could be explained by the confounding variable, the heat. The confound is the heat, the illusory, is the crime and the ice cream. So now that we've talked about correlational design, let's move into the experimental designs. And these are carefully controlled experiments to test if we actually have a cause and effect relationship. That means because we manipulated one thing, we actually saw its effect somewhere else, the independent variable, the dependent variable. So in cause and, cause and effect, the changes in one variable cause the change in the other variable. So when we have an experiment, we often have the experiment or the treatment group. This is the group that we are giving the manipulation, we are changing in some way. 
And we compare that to the control group, a group that is otherwise equal to our experiment group, but does not have the manipulation. And it's important when we're doing these kinds of research projects, when we're doing an experiment, that we have a proper operational definition about our variables. This is just a fancy way to say we establish a functional definition as to how we measure variables. Because to be frank, psychology uses a lot of abstract, complex topics like emotion, mood, anger, and those are fairly difficult to quantify. So we as researchers have to come up with a way to properly operationalize these variables and give a true operational definition and explain how we will meaningfully measure these variables. So a few final notes to keep in mind with your experiment. When you're designing an experiment, a few things you may run into are biases, such as an experimenter bias, which is when a researcher's expectation about their study causes a skew in their result. In other words, it's because you're, let's say you're the experimenter, you know you're doing your study, you think, oh, you're right, and you're expecting to see it. And so this sometimes happens in these single blind experiments these experiments where the researcher knows if their participants are in a controlled group or the experimental group. And so to combat experiments or bias, we sometimes employ the double blind. This is an experiment designed where both the researcher and the participants aren't aware, they are not aware, to which group they are assigned to. This means the researcher is probably giving the control group a placebo, something you probably have heard of with the placebo effect, to compare the control and the placebo. And now you probably would think, well, if you know, people are given a placebo, what if they think it works? That is the placebo effect in a nutshell. People's expectations or beliefs influencing or determining their experience in a situation. But keep in mind, even when the placebo effect occurs in a good study, the manipulation should be noticeably greater than what occurs in the placebo. Now, when we're designing an experiment, of course, we have the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable is the variable that we are manipulating. So this is how we have that experimental group. The independent variable is the experimental groups. Uh, experimental group is receiving the IV manipulation. And then we have the dependent variable, the variable that we measure to see the effect of the IV. So in both the experimental group and, the, and in the control group, we see the IVs manipulated in the experimental group. And then we measure the effects for both and see the effects on the dependent variable, the variable we're measuring. So in a true experiment, the only, only change between these two groups is the independent variable. The experimental group has a change in the independent variable. And the effects of the, the independent variable will be shown on the dependent variable. So whatever happens to the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. So now that we know about the few study types, well, how do we get the people in our study? And well, we're gonna need some participants. Those are the subjects of a research study. Now typically we get them from what is known as a random sample. And a random sample is a subset of a larger population in which every member has an equal chance of being selected. So let's say if we had a random sample of Los Angeles Harbor College students, the population is all the students at Los Angeles Harbor College. So in a random sample of 60 Los Angeles Harbor College students, any student at Harbor College could be part of that 60 in a random sample. Now, after we have our participants, next in an experiment, we're going to have random assignment. And this means that all participants, all of those 60 people we selected, have an equal chance of being in either the experiment group, the group that receives manipulation, or the control group, the group without manipulation. And after all of that, we have our people, we go off and we do our research, we are subjecting our work to statistical analysis. This is the analysis to see if there are meaningful differences between the two groups. After all, when we have all of our data, that's just the first part. We need to see what that data means. And in doing so, we often calculate a p-value. So when we have a p-value, 
we know that data is significant when the p-value is less than 0 0.05. And that's just a fancy way to say the odds, the chance that this happened based on luck was 5% or less. In other words, 95% of the time, what happened, happened because of that manipulation. It's supported that that manipulation is what is causing this. So let's say you did find significance in your research and you've gone through all the steps, then you will be publishing your work in a peer reviewed journal article. This is an article that, these are articles reviewed by other experts and it provides feedback before the article is accepted in major publications. Now, those who are reading peer reviewed journal articles, some scientists may replicate the studies, that means reproduce, to make sure that the findings were accurate and valid, making sure that it's consistent, that this isn't left to chance, and then making sure that the study really measured what it's out to measure. Now, before we close up, we're just gonna talk a little bit about ethics. And let's take uh, some little break and look at a couple YouTube videos about some very uh, crucial examples of poor research methods. First is Zimbardo's prison study, and again, as a reminder of Milgram. And I'll let you guys watch both those videos. So now that you've seen, hopefully you've watched at least the Zimbardo video, it's clear that ethics are important. And because of what's happened in the past, now anytime there's testing with human subjects, it is important and actually required that researchers meet and receive approval from an IRB, the Institutional Review Board. When research is done, it is important that the human participants are given an informed consent form that is a written description of what they are to expect during the study, any potential risks, as well as the implications of the work. And always in the informed consent form must it be known that all involvement in the experiments are voluntary and participants are allowed to withdraw without any penalty at any point of the experiment. A few things to keep in mind, however, we can't always be honest with our subjects if we want truly accurate data. And sometimes we will have to use deception or purposeful misleading during the experiment in order to maintain the integrity of the experiment. But it's important that deception isn't harmful. So one of my favorite examples of deception in children's cartoons is when Mr. Krabs has SpongeBob and Patrick paint his whatever the room and he pretty much just lied about the paint being permanent in order for them to be more careful well if that was the case that would have been good deception we all know what it really was but that is a clear example of deception lying in order to maintain the integrity of the experiment but if you do choose to use deception then it's important at the end of the experiment that that that, that the deception is cleared up in the debriefing. This is the period where participants are told the tr that their participation is complete. They're given complete and truthful information about the experiment. And they're also given a little more resources and information if they want about the experiment and what to expect uh, when their peer review article may be published. Of course, there are also ethics with animals because many basic processes in animals are sufficiently similar to humans. It makes sense to use animals in place of humans to get more data, get more information about behavior. When we choose to study with animal participants, it is important that our research passes the approval of an institutional animal care and use committee, an IACUC. And the IACUC ensures experiments are using humane treatment. They conduct semi-annual facility inspections to ensure that all protocols are followed. And just like with the IRB, no project can proceed without the committee's approval. 